This is Crohn's and Colitis Foundation Perspectives on ReachMD. The following episode is brought to you by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and the American Gastroenterological Association. Coming to you live from the second annual Crohn's and Colitis Congress in Las Vegas, Nevada, from the Bellagio Hotel. I'm Brent Polk from the University of Southern California, Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and the chair of the Crohn's and Colitis Congress. I'm joined by Dr. Maria Abreu from the University of Miami, who's the co-chair of the Crohn's and Colitis Congress. And we're happy to talk with you about uh, some of our experience in the sessions today. So start us off, Maria. Let us know what excited you today about uh, our sessions. Yeah, I mean, it's been such a great day. There's an embarrassment of riches here at this Congress, really. And I had the privilege to go to the basic science session this afternoon. And it was organized by Thad Steppenbach and Jerry Turner. And as you know, these are two great pathologists that are very interested in epithelial biology. And uh, they took the topic of, of the intestinal epithelium and really kind of looked at it from a lot of creative vantage points. The session had invited speakers. It also had a lot of young talent that their abstracts had been chosen. And very nicely, actually, maybe by coincidence, uh, a lot of them had been funded by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, which also kind of made me proud. And, you know, some of their key talks this afternoon was about how the epithelium is important, of course, in IBD. And there's this one uh, investigator from MIT, his name is Omar Yilmaz. And I, I must confess to you, I'd never heard of him before. And he's amazing. And one of the things that that I learned, and I, and I didn't know, is that if you go through periods of starvation, it actually tur- makes your intestinal epithelial stem cells happy. Who knew? And if you ate a high-fat diet, I almost sort of like don't want people to know that because I don't want my patients going out to eat a high-fat diet. But nevertheless, it was interesting how a high-fat diet and starvation had the same effect. And his hypothesis is that when you're starving, you mobilize fat. And you mobilize the ability to use fat as your source of energy as opposed to, you know, eating carbs. And so I thought that was interesting and to think about how that might be relevant in IBD because, you know, of course, we're looking for ways to also bolster epithelial function. So these uh, might be in the future actionable strategies. Sort of along that same vein of actionable strategies, Alexo Musi is at Sick Kids in Toronto. And he and I'd say Scott Snapper are very internationally known for their interest in very early onset IBD and the genes that are the underpinnings of this very early onset IBD. And these are kids that are unbelievably sick, right? These are kids that uh, you you know because you're a pediatric uh, gastroenterologist can die of these conditions. And unlike the kind of IBD that I see mostly in my office, which can be quite complex but is usually, you know, polygenic, lots of genes interacting to cause IBD. These are kids that really have like an autosomal dominant or recessive, but they, it's monogenic. It's often one gene that's really driving the whole process. And so when that, when the gene is a gene involved in immunity and involved in the immune response, you could imagine doing a bone marrow transplant, right? And giving that child a new bone, new immune system. But what if it's the epithelium that's the problem, right? You can't easily give a new epithelium. You know, maybe you could do a small bowel transplant, but in, in a lot of these kids, you don't even have that window, right? They're, they're months old when they start developing their disease. So he's developed really kind of neat models, first of all, to rapidly sequence these kids to identify where the problem is. Uh, but even using zebrafish, zebrafish, um, you know, because you're a scientist, have a beautiful GI tract and they're transparent so you can see what's going on in real time. And so he's actually tested drugs in these zebrafish to identify drugs that might be useful in some of these kids. And so I think that that's so powerful, right, that you can save a life in that way. So that was what turned me on this afternoon. That was an amazing session. I really enjoyed uh, as well. So this meeting, as you know, invites both clinicians and basic scientists and encourages their interactions. What sort of things might clinicians have taken away from some of today's meetings? Yeah, I mean, I I really feel, you know, I, I, I see a lot of patients and I have a basic science lab and I really think one informs the other. And to the extent that, you know, as, as clinicians, um, I think it's terribly important that our, that our meeting is structured the way it is, right? Um, for most of the sessions at this meeting, we combine the basic sciences and, and the clinical work again because these have to work hand in hand. And so, as I mentioned, I mean, if it wasn't for some of these discoveries that these children, these children who are, in a, in a sense, accidents of genetics that really inform what's happening in common garden variety IBD, 
and looking at the ways that scientists are trying to sort of move the needle so that we can some days have therapies. Because you no, know, and I know as, as clinicians that take care of these patients, that we leave so much on the table that we are still nowhere near precision medicine approaches. And so the idea that at least if you can start simple with these diseases where you know what the genetic defect is, that if we can have some traction with those, maybe we can apply those principles to garden variety IBD, for lack of a better expression. How could you encourage the basic scientists to have conversations with some of the clinicians to really understand the gaps in taking care of patients that yeah. investigators could help well, address? I, I think it's so important. I think that what I say to my you know, my colleagues in the basic sciences who, who will complain if they don't get a good score on, on a grant that they've submitted is that, you know, when I'm reading a grant, I need to know that the person who wrote that grant really understands the disease. It's one of my pet peeves. And so here's a wonderful opportunity to sit in a lecture hall. I'm sure the person next to you is a clinician. Listen to the things that are really driving us, the real where the questions are. You know, I think all good science should start with a clinical observation. And so at this meeting, you have chock full of clinical observations that require someone to be thinking, I wonder what's up with that? Like, how do I get to the root of that? And so I think it's just sort of not being shy. Um, I think at this meeting, which is, I think, really one of the only meetings that's all about IBD, where the, where the basic scientists and the clinicians are, are shoulder to shoulder, we've provided a lot of opportunities for people to mingle, you know, whether it's the poster sessions, giving them booze at the poster session, which always loosens up uh, people. Wine and cheese helps. Exactly. Wine and cheese. And so I think that we've given them a lot of opportunity for people to, to amble around and get to know each other. Hopefully that'll happen. That's a terrific observation. So tomorrow's sessions, as we look ahead, we're kicking off the day with Aaron Elinov from the Weissman yeah. Institute. He's really made important international observations that a calorie is no longer a calorie. It depends on what your microbiome is and how uh, much of those nutrients are actually absorbed and what that effect might be on you from an immune standpoint, whether it's type 2 diabetes or, as we'll hear about tomorrow, uh, for informing inflammatory bowel disease. So as you look ahead to tomorrow's sessions, what, what's exciting you about the day? You know, I really love uh, tomorrow afternoon we're going to have a microbiome session. will be the basic science parallel. And it really dovetails nicely because the morning is going to be on environmental triggers of IBD. And, of course, the microbiome is part of that. And then to sort of end the day with specifically the microbiome as it relates to IBD and also nutrition and host bacterial interactions. We have a lot of really rock stars speaking into our afternoon session all day, really. So I think that that I, I can really see that clinicians are, could also really enjoy the basic science stuff that we're having tomorrow afternoon. It really is a packed meeting that really brings together great ideas, cutting edge uh, science with uh, new standards of care and guidelines for how we should treat our patients to, to cure these diseases and in the meantime, have patients have better outcomes. So we've really enjoyed coming to you today from the Crohn's and Colitis Congress in Las Vegas. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in Austin, Texas next year at the, Crohn's, the third annual Crohn's and Colitis Congress. You've been listening to Crohn's and Colitis Foundation Perspectives. To access other episodes of this series, visit ReachMD.com foundation, where you can be part of the knowledge.